thank you for the congregational and special music uh, this morning. It was really good. Uh, if you will, open your Bibles to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read verses 19 through 26, and I just got a couple of words, really one word, a couple of words, I guess, that I want to pick up out of 19 through 21 because I want to look at the let us in verses 22 through 25 uh, this morning. If you can comfortably stand, please do so. We're going to start with verse 19 and read through verse 26. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us, that's the first one, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure, pure water. Second, let us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Here comes the third, let us. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let's stop right there at verse 25. Take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare you for his word this morning. Heavenly Father, as I bow in your presence this morning, I come, Father, as humble as I know how, asking for a move of your Holy Spirit, asking for an unction, an anointing to keep our minds focused upon your word, Father, to uh, look into your word, to glean from your word, some precious, precious jewels from your word, Father, that you have spoken through the writer of the book of Hebrews, and God just ask you, Father, to uh, take our minds uh, to take it away from anything else that would distract from your word. Father, you're very capable of doing this, Father. You know that it's my desire, it's my heart's desire to focus upon nothing except your word. And I pray, Father, for uh, every uh, heart that's here, every mind that's here, that they would uh, zero in upon your word, that they would give a uh, yield unto the Holy Spirit, that they would dethrone everything in their life, in their mind, in their hearts, and uh, yield unto you and the Spirit and the Word to listen to the Word. Uh, if they're your children, to conform more to the image of your Son. If there's someone here that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that this might be the day that, Holy Spirit, that you would draw upon that heart, that you would convict that heart, that you would convince that heart uh, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that they might come and ask for forgiveness of their sins and be covered by the blood of Jesus. I ask you, Father, for you to take your word, for you to send it forth, for you to accomplish your divine will in this service today. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. I want to go back to uh, verse 19 uh, very quickly, and as I said, I'm going to kind of go through. Verse 19 says, therefore, and therefore is referring back to 17 and 18, and 17 says that our sins and our lawless deeds I will remember no more. 18 says there is, is remission of these, which means that there's complete disappearance of those and there is no need for any offering of our sins. So he's saying that our sins has been forgiven, our sins has been cast away, they will no longer be remembered against us anymore, and then that's where the therefore comes in. Then he said, brother, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And then I want us to look at verse 20. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us. You know, I want us to look at that word us. Because we're going to be looking at three different times that the writer of the book of Hebrews. And again, I'm not going to debate 
who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some says it was Paul. Some says it was Barnabas. Some says it was Luke. I don't know who wrote uh, the book of Hebrews, but it uh, fell within the canon of the Bible. It fell through and worked through its way uh, to be able to be placed in the Word of God. So it is God spoken, and I'm not going to worry about who the writer uh, of the book of Hebrews is. Uh, but we're going to find the word us. We're going to find let us three different times, and it could actually have been put in uh, down through verse 25. It could have actually been put in five different times and not really taking anything away. But who is us? We need to know who us is if we're going to be looking at let us, let us. Here it comes up by a new and living way which he consecrated for us. God consecrated a way for us. Who is us? He has just told us. He has consecrated a way by the blood of Jesus for a people to go into the holy of holy. So it is a people that has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ that has made, been able to make, able to go in, have access to go into the holy of holies through a high priest that is never, this is a new covenant that has been brought in to existence and they are trying to get adjusted to it because it is by faith, it is not visual. They had been used to seeing a visual priest standing outside the temple and a priest that would take it to a high priest and this high priest could only go behind the veil once a year and that was when God came and shown himself through the cloud or whatever and that he would, he would even have a, a rope with a bell to where if the bell quit clanging they knew that he had not cleansed himself well enough and he had died so they would drag him out of the holy of holies so they were used to seeing something visual and now God had changed this to where there was a new high priest that had forgiven sins and they were saying that they could go into the holy of holies and he had concentrated by a new and living way which God had consecrated for us through a new high priest which was Jesus Christ himself by his blood the veil, it says, through the veil, which is his flesh, Jesus Christ's flesh. So we need to see who us is. So if you're here today and you're a born-again believer and you have accepted Jesus Christ and you are covered by the blood, you're in this us here in verse 20. And when we start down through here and we start reading in verses 22 through 25, we're going to see, let us, let us, let us. Who is us? If you're a born-again believer, you're covered by the blood of Jesus, then you're in that us this morning. And that's all I wanted to clarify in those verses. If you will, Jesse, go ahead and drop down to verse 22, and let's look at the first us. He said, let us, us, and I want you to notice this, and I want you to see what he said first in the first four words. He said, let us draw near. I want you just to think about that for just a moment because every one of you have had an invitation to something somewhere sometime that was very special to you that you probably thought you weren't going to get an invitation to whether it was to play in a band whether it was to get an invitation to a wedding or whether it was to I sat back and watched these college football players sometimes in the draft and they sit there on the couch and they get all of these friends and they get all of these family and they're waiting to see what order they'll get to draft and what team they'll get to get, go to draft and they get so excited. I mean, they start knocking furniture over and they get so excited because they're going to get a paycheck and they're going to get all of this. And I was just thinking when I read these four words, let us draw near. What is he saying that we can draw near because we've had a new consecrated way through the high priest of Jesus Christ? What is he saying that we can draw near to? We can go into the holy of holies. We can go in and have access to God. We can get into the presence of God when we have mer we need mercy, when we need grace. He's saying, draw near. Church, that's something to be excited about, to have an invitation, a wide open invitation to say, draw near. That's what he said. Let us, as God's people, 
draw near. But now he's going to throw out some prerequisites uh, that I want you to draw near. But the first thing that he says, I want you to draw near with a true heart. And if you look up that word true in the Greek, it, 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 it carries with it a real sincerity, a, a, a very uh, seriousness about, and I, I, I thought about this. I went back and read some of Jesus' words when he was talking to some of the groups that he was with. And he said, you know, you worship me, me outwardly with your lips and your words. And that's some of Jesus' terminology. And I'm paraphrasing some of the things. But he said, your heart's so far from me. And this I thought about when he said, with a true heart. I just tried to imagine when Jesus looks down on just the United States of America today. And he sees all the millions of people that are gathering together in God's house. In a place that has a steeple on top of it. And, and we call it church. And we say that we're worshiping God. I wonder how many are sitting as, as Brother Wesley got up and said a little earlier in the song service. How many of you are really listening to the words of this song? How many of you are really worshiping God with those songs? Or how many are just sitting here and saying, I wonder when we're going to get this song service over. And I wonder when that preacher's going to quit screaming and hollering so that I can get down to Ropers or I can get down to Mojo's uh, so I can get to the pizza and get in line. And I wonder when we can get all of this over with. He said, come with a sincere heart. Come on, guys. Get serious with me. I gave my son so you can have a high priest, uh, so you can come into my presence, uh, and you can have a fellowship, a cornea with me, God Almighty, so that you can be in my presence uh, and be with me. So get serious about this thing. Uh, that's what God was saying here. And then he said in full assurance uh, of faith. What does the word full mean? It means full, don't it? If it's full, it's not half empty. Don't have room for anything else. It's full assurance of faith. See, they had visuals up to this time, and they were having some problems back in, and whoever wrote this, at that time, but this was around 60 A.D. or so, 50, 60 years after Jesus had left earth, and, and they were looking around, and, and, and what the writer was saying is, is how full assurance of faith. Don't get hung up on this thing. Be solid with your faith. Be full. Get in, give it all. Get in it and, and, and sell out to it. Be full assurance of faith. And then he goes on, having our hearts sprinkled uh, from an evil conscience. See, they were used to having the blood. I went back and read some in Leviticus, you know, how they would bring them out. And if they wanted to cleanse them from leprosy, they would have certain kinds of blood. And they'd sprinkle that blood on them. But this was physical blood that they would sprinkle on them. He was saying, I'm not worried about the physical body and I'm not worried about blood that you can see. I'm saying having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, I did it with my son Jesus. Uh, I've cleansed you. Put your full assurance in that. Put your full faith in that. Give it all. Put it all in one basket there so that you can have a clear conscience and come on in. Don't, don't doubt that that Jesus did it all. He did it all for you. He covered it all. He did it all on the cross. So be have your heart sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, a lot of the, the, the commentaries thinks that that's water baptism. I don't think it had anything to do with water baptism. I find in different occasions in the book of Ephesians, I believe it was, it talked about water being the word. In the book of Titus, it talked about the water being the Holy Spirit. I think it was the word and the Holy Spirit that he was talking about. They were used to seeing basins of water and water being splashed on them. I don't think he was talking about water in a physical. I think he was saying, let the word, let the Holy Spirit, let it wash your body. Let it cleanse you. Let it clean you up. Let it purify you. Let you know that you're a clean person through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Now let's look at the next one, verse 23. Let us, there's us again, let us hold fast, hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. This old world today is trying every way in the world to get us to waver. And I want to tell you something. A big, big majority. I don't want to throw percentages on it because I really don't have accurate data to throw out at you. But a big percentage of the churches today are wavering from the faith. They'll do anything and everything to bring the numbers up. They'll do anything and everything to bring the tithing up. It's sad. What the writer of the book of Hebrews and what God told him to write down is hold fast the confession of your hope. The great expectation that Jesus is coming back and you're going to stand before him and him only. And you're not going to stand before a feel-good group and say, well, I got more people in than Joe Blow down the road did. And I got more people in and I got them more excited and I got more to come and I got more to join the church and I got more put in the offering plate and I got bigger and better and I got all of this kind of stuff going my way. He said, hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering. And then listen how he finished that verse. For he, who's he? That's God. Do you believe that God, if he promised it, that he's going to be faithful to his promise? I guarantee you, I may fail you, but God won't. God will be faithful to his promise. He has always been and he always will be. If this world goes on, and I don't believe that it will another 2,000 years, you can count on it. He who promised will be faithful. He will come back. We will stand before him. We will be judged. Later on in this chapter, in verse 30, he said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, that's a pretty strong statement, ain't it? That's right there in the same chapter. Let's go on to verse uh, 24. Here's the third, let us. Let us consider one another. I looked that word consider up just to see what was he really trying to say, consider. And the best I could tell from the study of that word consider, it would be think carefully, put a lot of thought in it, Meditate on it. And then the next two words, if you're going to meditate, think, then the next two words, he said, one another. I want you to consider, meditate about one another. And you're going to find, as we go on to the next verse here in just a minute, that he was talking about a church assembly congregation. So when you're thinking about each other, is it, he, he says some strong stuff right here. When we're thinking about one another, he said, I want you to think about each other and I want you to think about one another in order so that you can stir up. I want you to stir up each other and we do a pretty good job at that. But we don't do it what he says to do it. We keep each other stirred up pretty good. But he says stir them up for love. Make them love each other more. Make them love you more. I want you to consider one another in order that you can stir them up.
We'd like for that verse to stop right there. But he said, I want you to stir up their love. And I want you to stir up their good works. I want you to do something. I want you to consider something to do toward them that will stir them up. So that they will love you and love somebody else more and want to do something good for somebody else. Now boy, that takes on a whole new meaning, don't it? But that's the third let us. That's what God's children that was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ that has a high priest that's allowing us to go into the throne room of grace That's what he's wanting to let us after we draw near with a sincere heart and after we hold fast our confession then let us stir up somebody else. Let us consider each other. Let's consider one another and let us stir up one another for love and for good works. And then we could put a let us in verse 25, but he didn't put a let us. We could say let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Because what had happened was that they were beginning to feel the pressure. and They decided we'll just stay home. It's easier to stay home on Sundays. It's easier not to get involved in church. It's easier not to do this. It's easier not to do that. So let's just stay home. And the writer said, don't forsake. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's a command. And when people are bold enough to say, it's just easier to sit in my PJs at home and drink coffee and watch it on Facebook, You've got a God that you're going to stand before someday and answer for that. When you say, I've got other things that are more important to me to do than go to church on Sunday, there's an issue that you're going to answer with God with, not me. Because that's a command from God. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But you could put another let us, let us exhort one another. What does exhort mean? I, the best definition I could find is strongly encourage. Christians, do we not need to strongly encourage each other today? Let us strongly encourage. There's another one another. Stir up one another to love each other, one another, and to encourage somebody to do some good works. And now let us strongly encourage one another. And then he gives us the reason why. Why do we need to stir up? Why do we need to encourage, strongly encourage so much more, so much the more, I like the way he said that. So much the more as you see the day approaching. How many of you believe that today Jesus is closer to coming back than he was yesterday? Just from what you see in the world and what's going on in the world and what's going on in the churches and what's going on in the families and what's going on everywhere, the day's approaching, is it not? I think it was Franklin, no, it was Billy Graham, I believe, Billy Graham's wife, that made the statement that if God don't come back soon, he's going to have to write a letter of apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. And is there not a lot of truth to that statement? When you take a look at what the United States of America is doing in aborting babies, how many babies have been aborted? When we're taking and we're trying to put it in schools 
to teach our kids that you decide whether you're a boy or a girl and we'll put you on the surgery table and make you whichever one you think you are. And we're putting children in homes and saying, it's okay, you be raised by two women that is husband, or I don't know what you call them, wife and wife or whatever, but you're married. But we'll put a child in a home with two men and say, that's your daddy and daddy. And you're going to be raised that way until you graduate from high school and expect that child to come out normal. We today see the day fastly approaching. I want to tell you something. Jesus is truly coming back, and that's what that verse say. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What does look at that verse? The whole thing stems around what he just said at the end. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Exhort, strongly encourage one another. Because so much the more, as you see, the day is approaching. It's all so crucial. Not because Gary Burden said it. Because it's the word of God. And God knows what he's talking about. When we start isolating ourselves off from the world. Sitting down. Then God has a great opportunity. Musicians, would you come?